Okay, today we are very pleased to have Roland Fleming here as a uh, invited speaker. Uh, in fact, Roland is from one of us, yeah. <laughs> it's from one of, even though I, I couldn't uh, kind of claim credit, but I can claim credit on behalf of the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Roland was here as a postdoctoral fellow, and before that, Roland was uh, doing a. Uh, undergraduate at Oxford, yeah, I, actually I heard first from Felix about it as well, yeah, and since 2010 he has been the Kurt Kofka Professor of Experimental Psychology in the University of Gießen and is currently the Executive Director of the Center for Mind, Brain and Behavior of the University of Marburg in Gießen, so that's really fantastic. And this research combines, you know, this is really system uh, vision science at a very system level. You have computational, you have psychophysics and computer graphics and image analysis. And, you know, this is really also, uh, we were discussing not only the natural science, you also have the machine learning parts in mathematics and so on. Yeah. To understand and estimate the physical properties of objects and materials. And uh, he coordinates the EU-founded Marie Curie Training Network, PRISON, which is uh, short for Perceptual Representation of Illumination, Shape, and Materials. Uh, in 2013, he was awarded a Young Investigate Award by the Vision Science Society, which is actually a very big society, and we have these awards, you know, coming to not very often recently. Yeah, and uh, in 2016, an ERC a consolidate grant for the project SHAPE on the perception of growth, form, and process. And 2022, only last year, and congratulations, elected fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. And personally, I really like mid-level vision, and so uh, it's it's an honor. It's great to have you here, and honor to introduce you. So please, yeah. And also, Roland said that he can entertain uh, short questions, if just for understanding, yeah. And perhaps we can, uh, you know, leave the longer conceptual questions end of the talk, yeah. Okay, awesome. great. Please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Thank you so much for having me here. Great. Really, it's wonderful to be back in Tübingen. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, sun's shining. It feels great to be back. So thank you so much for having me. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about learning to see stuff. Um, and it's working. Okay. So every time we open our eyes, we immediately gain access to this incredibly rich world of visual sensations. Uh, there's so much more to our subjective experience of the world than just labels assigned to regions or whole images. Um, without reaching out and touching an object, we can make uh, a wide range of judgments about the physical properties. Uh, we can judge what it would feel like if we were to touch it. So we can judge, for example, surface shape, whether something is hard or soft, wet or dry, uh, rough or smooth, is it heavy or light, is it standing upright or has it fallen over, um, and identify risks and pleasures and uh, just imagine what it would feel like to interact with the outside world. And um, this really raises a whole series of questions, and I think some of these have been somewhat neglected within uh, our field as a whole. Yeah, so the, the physical characteristics, the, the look and feel of materials really are such an integral part of our everyday experiences. Materials ooze and pop into our haptic and visual experiences from childhood onwards. And of course, what something is made out of also has impact for how much it's worth to us. So this particular form of carbon here is valuable not just because it's rare and durable, but because it glints and uh, sparkles in a mesmerizing sort of way. Um, and of course, as biological agents interacting with the outside world, it's very important for us to be able to make judgments about the state of things and surfaces and objects that we interact with, whether the ground is safe to tread on, whether some potential food source is good to eat. Um, and so this raises a whole series of interesting questions for us as researchers, um, which, as I said, I think have been sadly too neglected within our field. Um, and I think that really materials are fascinating that we should spend more time thinking about them. So due to their, their complexity, due to their diversity um, and their mutability over time, materials pose some unique challenges to the visual system. And my research program, uh, a significant portion of my research program is about trying to understand how does the brain infer the physical pro properties of objects and materials and how do we visually reason about them and make judgments that let us predict their future behavior and work out how to interact with them. 
Um, and then also philosophical questions which also have practical implications as well. So what exactly do we mean by appearance? How can we capture it? How can we represent it? How can we think about it um, and measure it and model it? Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of those themes today. Now, just zooming back and thinking, well, how could we go about working out the material properties of a surface? There are obviously many different kinds of cues that we could draw on, for example, the, the texture or the shape or the motion, and of course, the way that um, light interacts with surfaces. That's the, really the starting point, historically speaking, for where material perception research began. It grew out of research on color constancy, um, but nowadays it's broadened to, to many other aspects. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but I'm actually going to start off by spending some time talking about shape and motion cues to material, which I think are some of the source of information that have received the least uh, uh, interest within our field so far. But we know that shape must be extremely important because this is the basis upon which classical sculpture is predicated. Because, for example, here, it's very common for an artist to take a block of a single homogeneous material and then with great skill form it and hew it into particular shapes and forms that convey and depict sometimes very um, subtle uh, material characteristics. So as you can see here, um, particularly with this sculpture on the, on the left-hand side, we don't just see that there is a body and some cloth. So assigning labels to them, but we get very precise and subtle and um, evocative impressions of the characteristics of the cloth that seems to be wet, it's clinging to the body. And all of this is conveyed just by the surface undulations. There's no, there's no motion, we don't get to interact with it. Um, and to the extent that we have this impression, um, it's a little bit of an illusion because of course it's actually just a lump of marble. Here's another lovely example. Um, this, this particular sculpture took seven years to carve. You can imagine how, um, with such care must have been taken for those vinyl chisel marks. You know, you don't want to go through one of the pieces of rope after spending seven years of your life on working on it. But the reason I'm showing it is not because it's just an amazing piece of uh, virtuosity, um, but also because we get an extremely vivid and compelling impression of the characteristics of this rope net. It seems to have a certain weight, a certain tension that's depicted to us by the, by the shape. And so somehow the brain is understanding from these mere geometrical forms about the, the characteristics of the, of the depicted material. It's another example here, um, just internal structure being depicted by sometimes very subtle shape cues. Um, and we've done a few studies on this, but I think this is really an area that needs a lot more research. It's an emerging area trying to understand what are these shape cues, how are they depicted by artists, for example, um, and how do we interpret those, how does the visual system interpret them. So here's another famous um, carving. This is by um, Giovanni Strazza, um, the Veiled Virgin. Um, of course, this is a particularly interesting case because the, um, the Virgin's face is completely covered in cloth. That's how we see it. We see this delicate, diaphanous, transparent material over the face, um, which means that every single surface point is depicting a point that is actually on the cloth. But subjectively, we have the impression of multiple layers. We're able to see through the cloth and see the form underneath the cloth. And in our experiments, we showed that participants are extremely good, extremely um, precise and consistent with one another at teasing apart the different causes of shape features. So those shape features that are due to the textile folding and organizing itself under its own internal characteristics um, are labeled in yellow. And those features that are due to the underlying face um, forcing the textile to conform to its shape are uh, indicated in blue. And we can see that the, the, the participants were very good at teasing these apart. <clears throat> One other interesting thing <clears throat> that I'd like to point out, which is um, the extent to which we um, make quite large scale um, extrapolations across uh, the, the stimulus. So for example, um, this region of the forehead and along the nose, of course, Perceptually and conceptually, we understand that there is a textile that's flowing across this region, but there's no local signal here at that point in the geometry that can tell us that. Our impression of the textile at these locations is inferred by interpolating between these ridges which are attributed to the other cores. And I think we don't really understand how that works and what, what is the nature of the computations that are being performed here and to the extent 
for which we have some kind of rich internal physical model of the way that textiles behave, or the extent to which this is drawing on some lower level cues that through um, extensive experience of looking at textiles and the way they drape, we're able to interpret. I think there's, there, there are many open questions here. Interestingly, also in the process of doing this experiment, we got a large number of very, very delicate gauze and muslin cloths and tried to reproduce the types of geometries that are depicted here, and we couldn't which means that we think that, so, so by draping the real cloths on people's faces, which means that the artist is actually deviating from physical reality um, in giving us this extremely compelling impression. I think that's another thing that we don't really understand. So many, uh, this is more of a demo, more just a, a meant to be thought provoking, raising questions rather than giving you answers on how, how this works. But so think, this is actually a photograph of a real sculpture. This is a photograph of a real sculpture. Exactly. And, and here, the whole material is the same. It's all it? just one lump of marble, of, well, alabaster. Yeah. Yeah. Real cloth, you cannot get that. Uh, well, when we tried to reproduce this pat these kinds of patterns, we could not find a configuration that would um, that would reproduce this. It's uh, uh, so so. Um, it's not to say there can there exists no such textile, but it's not trivial to end up with um, with these with these shape forms. Okay, so I mean, where do where do these cues come from? What what, what is the information? Well. Obviously, the physical properties, the material properties of different textiles determine the way that they respond to external forces. Um, and what this means is that different materials will self-organize into different characteristics, kinds of shape. Um, so on the left-hand side, we've got this silk, which is all kind of slinky and low friction and um, has certain kinds of fibers which cause it to organize into these flatter sheets with crisper edges. And then on the right-hand side, we've got this wool, which is springy and high friction. Um, and it causes it to uh, self-organize into these undulating patterns. So clearly there's some statistical characteristics that the visual system could use for teasing these apart. Um, but I just want to point out a conceptual problem, which is common to many mid-level vision problems, which is that, of course, a given object, a given material, can take on many, many different forms, essentially an infinite number of different forms. Every time I drape the same silk handkerchief, it will produce a different set of shapes, and somehow the visual system has to abstract those aspects that are common across the different instances. Um, so a single material can take on many different shapes. And how does the visual system work out uh, that they're the same material? Um, I think that's an, an interesting question. Um, so to, to, to follow up on this, I'm going to show you a, a quick study or summarize a quick study um, that we did focusing on another class of materials, which is liquids, which are the most mutable of the everyday uh, materials that we encounter um, so where the shape changes and changes dynamically over time these are computer simulations um, and what we're asking is really how does the visual system infer the viscosity of liquids viscosity is the single parameter that is most important for determining the way that liquids shape themselves and change and flow over time so it seems like a good starting point to ask about how that works um, and this was done by a former PhD student and then postdoc in my lab, Jan Jakob van Assen, um, who sadly has actually left academia now. Um, he's a very talented guy, um, but he's uh, running a great, a great team over in, in the Netherlands doing, um, doing some other things outside science. Um, so yeah, here are these computer simulations. And I think everyone will agree that you get quite compelling and vivid impressions of the intrinsic material properties when, when these things flow and move. The top, you can see the brunier liquids and the bottom, um, right hand side, you can see the thicker liquids. Um, and the question is, how does the visual system work out the intrinsic characteristics that um, these liquids have? And again, here's just another version of the demo I showed you a moment ago with the silk handkerchief. Each six of these, all six of these are the same liquid, but due to a little wind gust, a little perturbation um, as the liquid is flowing, it adopts different forms. And somehow, if I were to show you a new one, you'd also be able to work out that it was the same liquid again. There seems to be something about the rhythm of the movement that is common across those, which leads to the idea that maybe there are some statistical characteristics that the visual system can tap into, and we'll, we'll explore that in a few minutes. Okay, so here are the, here's the main question. You know, what cues do we use to perceive liquids? And then... Um, I think that the more challenging case is how do we achieve constancy? How do we recognize it's the same liquid across changing circumstances where other factors in the scene are also influencing the, the behavior and the, and the shape and the motion of the liquid? So we start off with a very simple rating experiment. 
Um, we've got um, 32 different levels of viscosity represented with these movies. Using computer graphics is very convenient. We can parametrically control the intrinsic properties while keeping everything else exactly the same, you know, lighting conditions, viewpoint, um, everything else about the liquid, the, its optical characteristics and so on. Um, and you can see we're going from something that's almost as runny as water all the way up to something which is almost solid. It's like kind of molten glass, barely molten, the sticky taffy, which is just, you know, barely moving. Um, and then in an experiment, we just had participants rate how viscous these liquids appear. We didn't have to spend a lot of time explaining what we meant. We showed them the stimuli and said, look, some of these are runny, some of them are thick. Move this slider to tell us how thick you see each of these liquids. Um, and so they would go through, um, it sealed 32 of these in batches of eight, randomized, um, and that was the, the experiment that we did. And we find that the, the ratings show that they're pretty good at this task overall. So what I'm plotting here, we also showed them, by the way, just little windows out of the movies, time windows from early on to later on. That's what's shown on the, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting how um, runny or viscous the liquid was in physical terms. Um, and then the color just indicates how, um, how runny or thick the, the participants saw them. So you can see over here, this is a runny liquid and it was rated as being runny. Um, here is a very thick liquid and it was rated as being very thick um, and here you can see an intermediate one and there's this small effect that early on in the movie the liquids are seen as being a little bit thicker than when we go to later time points then it appears to be a little bit runnier even though it's actually physically the same liquid. So that just basically shows that broadly speaking participants are pretty good at this, um, judging this, that's not um, not that surprising. We sort of already knew that just by looking at them. Um, the interesting question is what happens in between the liquid and the perceived viscosity, because that's what we're really interested in, is how does the visual system compute this, right? So the, the hypothesis is there's some set of mid-level shape and motion characteristics which summarize in a statistical sense the, 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 the properties of the stimulus in a way that let us then infer what the viscosity of the liquid is. Um, and so we hypothesized that, that there would be a set of such features and we brainstormed those features, um, came up with a bunch of names that describe characteristics of the, of the stimuli. And then we also got a bunch of participants also to do that. They looked at the stimuli and came up with names of characteristics and they came up with a very similar list. Um, and then all we do is we get another group of participants to rate all of the stimuli along each of these particular characteristics. So this new group of participants were never told anything about viscosity. They were never asked anything about viscosity. They were just shown all of the stimuli and given a descriptor of a particular characteristic. So in this case, elongated. How much is the shape stretched out in a single direction? And then they would go through stimulus by stimulus and rate that one particular characteristic for the stimulus. And then they do that for all 20 of the features that I just showed you. And the results show that participants were um, paying careful attention and performing the task that we asked them to do. So for example, here, um, the bottom stimulus, they were asked to rate how spread out is this stimulus. And you can see that at the bottom, it gets a high rating. On the top, it gets a lower rating, which I think most people would intu intuitively agree with. Um, and it really, the, the pattern of their results really demonstrates that they were paying attention to the characteristic that they were asked to pay attention to. It's nothing to do with using these ratings as a proxy for judging the viscosity. You can see here, there are two stimuli that have almost identical values of viscosity, but it just so happens that in one case, the thing becomes unstuck, and so it gets a high elongation rating, and in the other case, it stays stuck together, and so it gets a lower elongation rating. So you can see we get this complex, often non-monotonic pattern of responses, and um, this is true for all of the different 20 characteristics that we ask people to rate. So this time means every image you make them rate, or you wait until like a three frames past, then you rate now? Um, they, want, they get to see a loop of the movie that corresponds to a particular segment in time at different points. So, so they're either seeing from the beginning to uh, you know, a, a, a few hundred milliseconds in, or from a few hundred milliseconds in to that class a little bit, or, or towards the end of the movie. That's what, that's what it really is. Okay, so what we've got is a set of... Um, of, of ratings, um, none of which is the viscosity on its own, um, but which describes and summarizes the, the shape and the motion of these, of these stimuli. <clears throat> now, it turns out that there are certain redundancies between these ratings. So we applied a factor analysis, and we found out that you can group them into basically four classes. 
that um, describe different characteristics of the of the way that the the, the stimulus is organized. Um, we gave them fanciful names, which don't really mean anything. It's just it, when you're writing a paper, it's useful to be able to refer to the individual factors. Um, the important thing about this is that they um, are orthogonal to one another. So now we have a set of four orthogonal um, features or, or factors which summarize certain characteristics, each of which on its own correlates pretty poorly with the viscosity. Um, but when we take a weighted linear combination of those, then we can fit the viscosity ratings very well. So this is the idea that by projecting into this multidimensional feature space, we're able to um, use a combination of those features to then get a, 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 an estimate of what the viscosity is. Um, this is a bit trivial. Um, the fit works very, very well. Um, but here we're just fitting on the training set. So it's not it's not something particularly remarkable. The much more interesting question is how well does this concept or this model generalize to new situations, right? So we came up with a, another set of stimuli where the liquids are interacting with a much more diverse range of different uh, surrounding scenes. Um, and you can see they're exhibiting much more complex and um, different kinds of uh, behaviors within these scenes as they're, as they're moving around. Um, and then we got the participants to rate the, uh, got a group of participants to rate the viscosity of these, and then another group of participants to rate all of those uh, features again. And um, without fitting a new model, using the same weights as we had um, used in the original um, experiment, we find that that same model does a very good job of predicting the perceived viscosity um, in, this, in this case as well. And I think that proves the generalization of this concept. And so um, I just want to give a hint at why this works. It's this idea of projecting in a, into a multidimensional feature space that is basically the, the essence. So a carefully selected set of features that, that will um, let you disentangle viscosity from other factors. So what I'm showing you here is the problem facing the visual system. Um, this is representing the stimuli in terms of the raw image space, um, the movies that were shown. We ran a PCA on those. Um, and we can represent each stimulus in the experiment as a point within that um, space. Here, I'm just showing the, you the first two dimensions, but you get the basic idea. Um, so these two, these two triangles here, maybe I should use the pointer. Um, these two triangles here refer to these two movies. They come from the same scene, but it's the runny liquid and the thick liquid within that scene. And in terms of the raw stimulus, of course, these are very similar to one another because the appearance similarity is dominated by the scene that the liquid is interacting with. And that's true also for this pair here. This is a different scene. Two different viscosities within that scene are embedded at very similar locations in terms of the raw stimulus. But when we project those stimuli into the multidimensional feature space and then run PCA on that, now we see that that space has um, reorganized the stimuli, disentangling them from one another and reorganizing them according to their physical characteristics. So that now the two liquids that, have, that are both thin and runny um, are located at one end of the space, and the two liquids that are thick are located at the other space, allowing us to achieve this constancy by disentangling and reorganizing the space according to the physical factors that um, influence the, the behavior of the liquid. Question? Yes, I have one question. So you ask the people to rate the stimuli on the individual dimensions, but then you apply like the factor analytic technique. So what I'm wondering is the level of representations people actually use. Can you say anything about that? Or have you got any intuition what level that is? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the fact the purpose of the factor analysis is just really to show that um, we can come up, it was really to just to condition the um, regression model properly, because if you've got a high degree of collinearity, then you end up with spurious weights. And so I wouldn't think about those factors as being the domain within which people are making the judgments. I think that they're make, more making the judgments about the about the raw features underlying it. And this PCA is done on the raw features. It's not done on, on top of the factor analysis, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, that, that, but that's I have no empirical data to back up what I just said. That's a speculation or a gut feeling based on um, having taken part in the experiment myself. Yes. Sure. Okay, so um, just to briefly summarize this study so far, um, what we've shown is that shape and motion can provide very powerful cues for the estimation of material properties. And it looks like the visual system achieves constancy, so the ability to see the same material across different viewing conditions through the use of multiple complementary mid-level features. And each of these features on its own is quite imperfectly invariant. Uh, but when you take them together, 
as a multi-dimensional feature space in a high dimensional representation or this organizes the stimuli by distinct physical causes which are confounded in the proximal stimulus and this makes it much easier for high level processes then to read out the intrinsic physical properties of materials and so that's a kind of general framework for thinking about how we can how we can disentangle the factors um, that, that, that cause um, proximal stimuli. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to talking about optical properties of materials, um, in particular um, glossiness, uh, which is really pretty much the starting point um, for material perception research as it, as it grew out of color constancy research. And I'll just give a little tiny bit of background and then we'll get into some philosophy and then we'll get onto some machine learning stuff that I've been doing. Okay. So basic background, here's a bunch of spheres. They all um, have the same shape. They're all viewed under the same lighting conditions. And the reason that they look different to us is because they have different surface reflectance properties. And in everyday language, we have certain terms that we use rather imprecisely to try to characterize those different appearances, like the color and the gloss and the luster and the sheen and sparkle and stuff like that, um, which are not very well defined. Um, but um, which which are a bit vague. And so there's a, a much better way of describing um, the physical characteristics of the surface, which is a function called the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, which describes the amount of light reflected in every direction as a function of the light arriving from every direction. So it's a high dimensional function. Um, and it's very tempting to think of the visual system's goal um, in working out the reflectance characteristics of the surface as being estimating the BRDF from the proximal stimulus. Um, and that's certainly the way that it's normally handled in the computer vision literature. And this is an extremely challenging thing to do for a large number of reasons, not least uh, because it's a very high dimensional and complex, um, potentially highly dimensional and complex function. Um, fortunately, materials in the real world are rather constrained in their BRDFs. Um, and that means that it's possible to summarize BRDFs with analytical models that have a small number of parameters. Um, so here's an example of some computer generated images that were synthesized using one particular BRDF model developed by Greg Ward, um, where I'm varying just two of the parameters of this model. Um, on one axis, I'm varying the proportion of light which is reflected in a specular mirror-like way. Um, you can see that that has an impact on the apparent glossiness. Um, and then there's this other parameter which adjusts the microscopic roughness of the surface um, from very smooth to rougher, which causes a blurring out of the reflected features. Um, so across these two parameters, you can simulate a wide range of different plastic-like or paint-like uh, material appearances. Um, and so maybe it's not quite as bad as I made it sound. Maybe the visual system doesn't need to ex um, estimate the whole of this parameter space unconstrained. It can instead represent a small number of parameters, but it's still extremely challenging to estimate those from the proximal stimulus because the proximal stimulus is the result of complex interactions between many distal factors and all of these contribute um, to the image. And so, for example, if I've got an image like this, um, if I change, for example, the lighting conditions, um, then you will see that the stimulus changes in some ways, the pixel values are changing in certain ways. And then if I take the same world and I start changing the shape, then that will affect the pixel values in a different way. Um, and if I start changing the reflectance, then again, the pixel values are affected, but in a different way. Um, but all of those things are smooshed together. You're given a single stimulus and you've got to somehow disentangle those from one another. Um, and this is really challenging, right? Because, I mean, take, for example, the case of a chrome sphere. If you think about it, every single pixel in the image of that sphere is nothing more than a distorted reflection of the world surrounding the object. So if I take that same sphere and put it in a new context, then all the pixels change. And yet I've got to work out that this is the same object. So identical materials can lead to very different images. Um, but conversely, um, different materials can actually lead to very similar images. So it might not be immediately obvious from looking at these, but it turns out that um, this image, the pixels within the sphere of this image, are more similar to those in this image than either this is to that or this is to that. And the reason for that is because of the lighting conditions. So the positions of the highlights and the, and the positions of the shadows within this object are more similar here than they are in these cases. That's not what we experience when we look at this. We experience a similarity in terms of the intrinsic material properties. We see both of these as being chrome-like and both of these being sort of pearlescent. Um, so the, the question is, how does the visual system do this? Again, this disentanglement problem. How do you separate out the factors? Now, I'm going to take a small detour into um, a kind of philosophical um, uh, position 
that I want to take. I'm going to take an extreme position, and of course, over dinner or whenever, we can also um, discuss this, and maybe I'll concede a little bit, um, but I want to take an extreme position just for the purpose of provoking. Um, so it's, it's conventional, common, to pose um, these mid-level vision tasks as being essentially a process of inverse optics. That is, there's an optical process which takes the world and projects it onto the retina, and then what the brain does is it takes the retinal image and somehow does some inverse physics and reconstructs the characteristics of the world. And this presupposes that there is a set of physical characteristics, predefined physical characteristics, like, for example, the size of an object or distance between things um, or the orientations of surfaces or the reflectance like we were just talking about. And the goal of the visual system is to estimate these physical characteristics of the world based on the proximal stimulus that comes in. And what I'm going to argue now is that I don't think that this is the correct way of formulating vision. I think that we should abandon this as a, as a framework for thinking about what vision is and how it works um, for a number of reasons. And I think there are some fundamental, really fundamental reasons why that this is not even tenable as a view of how perception could work. Um, as you play around with materials and do material perception research, one thing that you will notice is that there are many appearance characteristics that lead to strong and vivid subjective impressions which don't have an easily defined physical counterpart. So for example, if I ask you, how antique does this jug appear to you to be? We have a subjective understanding of what I mean by that and we can make judgments about it, but it's not like we think the visual system is doing some kind of carbon dating or something like this, right? It doesn't seem like a feasible, um, feasible claim. Or how ripe is the pear, right? I mean, it's not like we're estimating ratios of sugars to water or something within the within the pear. But we have a subjective impression of what it what it means to see a, a ripe pear or an unripe pear. And there are many other characteristics. Like, for example, if you have a an old sweater, it gets all bobbly and uh, and worn out with the pills on it. It's a very distinctive appearance. You all recognise it. But what is the physical characteristic that's being estimated? And how did we ever know? But that is a property of the world that we need to estimate in the first place. It's not like this was a characteristic that existed in our evolutionary history. And in fact, it's very common for people when I make this claim to say, oh, yes, but evolution solves this problem. But it doesn't because there was no ancestor within our evolutionary history that had access to the ground truth state of the world. There's a fundamental problem with the idea that we learn to estimate properties of the world because learning to estimate properties of the world means learning a mapping between image stim it, it, proximal image, uh, image characteristics and distal scene characteristics. In other words, supervised learning. And this is not possible. There is no ground, ground truth source of information about the true state of the world, and there never was in our evolutionary history. It's no use saying that some of the other senses could educate vision because all of the senses are equally ambiguous about the outside world. Um, there are many points in the world which are beyond reach and yet we can still make judgments about them. And there are certain characteristics that are unique to a particular modality, like for example, color or gloss. You can't smell, taste, hear. Any other sense can tell you about what those optical characteristics are. And so this means that the inverse optics, which I believe, um, Necess necessarily implies supervised learning, for me, is an untenable way of thinking about how vision should work. Because what we need to explain is not just um, how we learn those mappings, but also what to estimate in the first place. So there's a much more general, higher level question, which is how does the visual system work out the ontology of the world, the, the, the factors that need to be estimated in the first place? Um, and so this brings me to the approach that I'm going to be arguing for today, which is based on unsupervised learning, because what we do get to experience throughout evolution and during our lifetime is big, big data, massive numbers of samples drawn from the real world. And what I'm going to argue is a paradoxical position, which is that learning to encode and predict the proximal stimulus as efficiently and accurately as possible teaches the visual system representations that are particularly well suited to disentangling the distal scene characteristics without any label um, about the outside world. Okay. So it sounds like a, a strange way of formulating vision. I mean, it's focused on the proximal stimulus, not on the distal stimulus. Um, but I'm going to try to run through an argument and give you a demo that actually this is a way of explaining not just the successes of human vision, but also the errors that we experience as well.
And this really gets at the heart of what is the single biggest statistical problem in the whole of um, vision, which is just knowing how to represent natural images and not too much more. Now, I don't really need to say this to this audience because I know that you're familiar with this, but let me run through, humor me, let me run through this example. So space of possible images is absolutely spectacularly at large, right? I mean, for, for any reasonable resolution of images, there are more images than there are atoms in the universe. Let's just focus down on a smaller constrained set of those. So little tiny 45 by 45 pixel images. There's still over 2000 dimensions. Almost every single one of those images looks like this, meaningless noise, right? And the visual system doesn't really need to be able to distinguish between these. What it really needs to be able to distinguish between is the tiny subset, subspace of images within that larger space that come from the real world. It needs to be able to distinguish between these very finely and can treat essentially all of the other images as an equivalence class of noise. So that means that what the visual system really needs to do is learn a manifold representation um, that conforms as closely as possible to the, the subset of, of natural images. Um, and in doing so, it will, I'm arguing, learn latent variables. If it's really successful, it will learn latent variables that are, are the generative processes that are responsible for the structure in images. Because images are not random. They're produced by lawful processes in the world. Um, everything from the laws of physics, like the fact that gravity makes things go down, or um, specular reflection, the way that light gets reflected from surfaces, to biological regularities, like the fact that faces have two eyes, or artificial regularities, like the fact that bicycles have two wheels, or shirts have a row of buttons on them. These are things sometimes which didn't exist in the evolutionary history, but which nevertheless lead to regularities in, in images. And um, in fact, these images here, as some of you will probably already know, are not photographs. They're images that were hallucinated by unsupervised neural networks trained on specific data sets to learn essentially just high order statistical relationships between values of pixels within the images. And in doing so, they learn to characterize the typical appearance as it would appear to a, a human observer of the data set that is trained on. I mean, the images on the left were trained on photos of, um, of famous celebrities. And if you go through item by item, you can't actually recognize any of these people because they don't exist. But they have the typical look of the kind of person you'd see on the front cover of a glossy magazine, including details like the way that flash photography interacts with makeup on their, on their skin. I mean, if you try to do this by inverse optics, this is a really challenging task. But by learning high order pixel statistics, um, it actually turns out that you can capture aspects of appearance that really resonate with what um, the human visual system seems to tap into. Um, so I'm going to um, describe to you now a study that was done by Kate Stalls, who was a postdoc in my lab. She's not got, running her own lab in New Zealand. Um, and so we're going to take this idea and try to implement it and see if we can use it to predict um, perception in or gloss perception. And this is using a class of neural network, which I'm sure many of you are much more familiar with than I am, uh, called autoencoders. But for those few people that are not familiar, again, please humor me while I run through the basic idea. The basic idea is very simple. These are a kind of neural network that essentially take it as input an image, and they have to produce as output the same image. Um, and that would be totally trivial except for the fact that they have to compress the image down to a bottleneck which represents the data set using a much smaller number of numbers than there are in the intrinsic um, number of pixels in the in the training set um, and by learning to do this if there are a small number of distinct physical factors in the world that describe the images the most compressed the most efficient depiction of those images would be simply to list the values of those parameters. And so that's the reasoning why a learning objective focused on the proximal stimulus can cause you to discover the underlying distal, the latent variables in the world that are responsible for structuring those images. That's the, the kind of hypothesis. So we took this class of neural network and we trained it on a constrained world, a world that we synthesized um, using computer graphics consisting of bumpy surfaces with different reflectance characteristics, um, different levels of gloss, different colors, and so on. Um, specifically, the neural network we used was a bit more advanced than a, a vanilla autoencoder, which didn't work. Um, this is a, a slightly more elaborate version called the Pixel VAE. Um, it's variational, um, and so it represents uh, a, a likelihood of each pixel as a function or conditioned on the preceding pixels in the image, and also conditioned on um, a, a low dimensional code describing those characteristics that 
are common to all of the pixels in the image, essentially. So that you can think of this in, in simple terms as having two main branches as a kind of pixel prediction branch, um, which is doing spatial predictions on pixel values. And then there's this kind of other branch, which is like a compression branch, which is summarizing characteristics of the image as a whole. And the pixels are conditioned on that as well. And all of the analyses I'm going to show you now focus on this compressed representation, where we're allowing the neural network only 10 numbers to describe all of the variation in the images um, across the data set that we've um, shown it, tens of thousands of images. OK, and what we find is that after training on this data set, um, the neural network learns a really interesting um, internal representation of the characteristics. So in terms of the raw image space, if we run a TSME um, embedding on this so that we can visualize images embedded in 2D, then you'll see that high gloss images and low gloss images are deeply entangled with one another. There's no simple way of separating out from a given for a given image, whether it's high gloss or low gloss. But inside the neural network's latent code, it has um, exquisitely separated out the low gloss images from the high gloss images, even though it's never given any labels. This is not supervised learning. It just knows, or it's discovered, that to succeed at its objective of being able to learn the, 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 the pixel probabilities, um, this is a useful representation for doing that. Um, it's discovered to separate out physical characteristics. And in case you're wondering what these different, why are these, these different blobs here among the high gloss materials? Well, it turns out those are the different lighting conditions that we used, um, which are neatly separated out from one another, but much harder to separate for the, for the matte surfaces, as you would expect from our own subjective experience. You can also um, read out to a certain extent the, the lighting direction and to a lesser extent, um, a little bit about the bump height. That's not, that's not so well disentangled. Now, to contrast this, um, we also trained a neural network in a supervised way, where we give it the explicit label for every image. This is a high gloss image. This is a low gloss image. Of course, such a network can also learn to tease apart high gloss from low gloss images. Um, but it does not spontaneously also learn to separate out the light field or the angle or the surface relief or anything else, because that's not in its objective function. It doesn't add anything to its uh, ability to perform the task. And so um, both of these networks perform roughly equally well at gloss perception. One of them has spontaneously discovered to disentangle the different features, and the other one hasn't because it doesn't need to. Now, we can then read out and decode um, estimated values of, of gloss from this latent code. Um, by you know just a simple linear readout, and that allows us to project any new image that we might have into its latent space and and s and get a readout of you know how glossy does the neural network see them as being, and this tends to align quite well with human judgments of glossiness. So um, images that depict relatively matte materials are at one end of the latent space, and um, images that depict to humans glossy surfaces are depicted, uh, uh, represented at the other end of the latent space. Um, and in fact, when we compare those read out values with human ratings of glossiness, we find that the neural network's ratings correlate with human gloss ratings better than the real physical specular reflectance of the surface. So this is a first indication that what the neural network has learned more closely aligns to human judgments of the appearance of the surface than the real physical characteristics do, right? Which is again, a little bit of a, uh, you know, raises questions about whether inverse optics is the right way to think about. Um, and we compared it with a bunch of other models and it's, it does better than the other models. That's not so interesting. Um, another cool thing that you can do with such models is that they're, you can use them as generative um, systems as well. So we can draw samples from the latent space and tell us to create a bunch of pixels. Um, and depending on where within the latent space we go to, you'll get predictable, you'll get images that predictably look like different kinds of materials to observers. So if we go to a particular starting point within the latent space, if we move along that um, axis that I showed you earlier and sample from regions that are, according to the neural network, less glossy, then they also, these images that get synthesized look less glossy to humans. And if we go in the other direction, then you get um, images of surfaces that look more glossy to humans. So it seems to be really capturing something about the relationships between pixels that look to humans um, more or less glossy. So I'm just going to finish by um, showing you what I think is the, is the hardest um, or more challenging case to explain, which is uh, constancy and its failures. So remember, constancy is this ability to see something 
as having the same characteristics when you change viewing conditions. Now, it turns out that humans don't have perfect constancy. We're pretty good, generally speaking, but there are actually systematic errors that we have as well. And there's this quite well-documented phenomenon. Um, I'm just showing you a reference to one of the papers that's talked about this, but this was discovered before this one, um, which is that if you change the relief, the surface relief of a surface, then the same exact material can look more or less glossy. So all three of these have exactly the same reflectance, but most people will see this as the one on the left appears relatively matte, and the one on the right appears relatively shiny. You know, they're all exactly the same. And the question is, how do you come up with a model that can predict those kinds of illusions or errors um, of gloss perception? And it turns out that without any additional work, the neural network that we had trained, this unsupervised neural network, also suffers from this kind of illusion. So we make the, we vary the bumpiness, and it also, the, the position within the latent space says that the, um, the surface should appear more glossy as a result. So we, we took this as an opportunity to then test directly whether the unsupervised neural network or the supervised neural network can better predict the errors that humans make. So um, we, we got a whole series of these sequences where we're varying the bump height and measuring the position within the latent space and reading out the, perceived, the, the model's prediction of the perceived gloss. And you can find some sequences where it goes up monotonically and then other sequences where it goes up and then comes back down again, all of these different um, qualitative forms. And then we show those same images to humans and we see that at least in broad terms, qualitatively speaking, the human data aligns quite well with the predictions of the unsupervised network and not at all aligns with the predictions of the supervised neural network. So we have, here we have two different models trained according to two different objectives, which instantiate two different hypotheses about how the visual system could learn to see about the outside world. And one of the, they both make errors, but they make different predicted errors. And one of them lines with humans and the other does not, which I think is a nice way of teasing apart um, or instantiating these hypotheses. Um, yeah, so that just shows that again. Yeah. You mentioned the, the sure. supervised network, uh, what was the training target? Was it both glossiness and uh, bump height? No, just the gloss, just the gloss, yeah, yeah. So when, when you train on both, is it possible to make the correct prediction? If you train it on both, it makes fewer errors. But it deviates more from humans. So. Uh, well, what you would get is basically just flatter curves here, um, which is also not what humans yeah. do. So it would be a different set of uh, predictions, but still different from what humans do. But it was trained by humans' perception, not trained by the physical gloss in it. No, it's trained by physical gloss. Oh, it's, it's, it's trained by physical gloss, but nevertheless... Mm. Like we were talking about over lunch, even an ideal observer will not get the answer right all the time. And we specifically found sequences where both neural networks made errors, but they made different patterns of errors. So out of... Tens of thousands of sequences, you can find many where they make um, uncorrelated predictions and then run the human as the, to adjudicate between the models. That's the, that's the kind of the, the, the research approach. Yeah, so, and again, um, when it comes to this question of predicting the, the, the pattern of errors, the unsupervised model outperforms a whole bunch of other models as well at predicting human, human errors. So um, what I've shown you basically is that um, world factors spontaneously emerge in the supervised model's latent code and the unsupervised model predicts human perceived gloss both for novel renderings that weren't in the training set and also for the network generated images as well and so this unsupervised model predicts the failures of, go of gloss constancy on a stimulus by stimulus um, basis better than a supervised model and i think that gives some interesting um, indications that it's a good way of thinking about perception i think i'll skip over the next few slides and go straight to the conclusions so we don't run out of time. So let me just wrap up here. Okay, so big picture, um, I'm gonna, what I've suggested to you today is that we, I think we should let go of the idea of inverse optics. I think that the main goal of vision is not estimation, it's disentanglement. It's really trying to factorize what are meaningful sources of variation in the world that lead to meaningfully measurable sources of variation in the proximal image data. And reflectance properties, so gloss, um, are just one of many latent variables that structure proximal image data. And in fact, I think we should also maybe even just forget the idea of cues as well. You know, these DNNs often have very high dimensional feature spaces. Um, 
cues bring, the concept of cues brings a very strong experimenter bias and set of pre-existing hypotheses into the framework of trying to understand vision. Maybe we should be thinking on a computational level in terms of what are learning objectives that lead to internal representations that disentangle. That might be a better way of understanding or providing principled explanations of what vision does. I've argued that learning to compactly and accurately encode and to a certain extent predict, I kind of skipped over that part of the talk, uh, predict uh, proximal image data, these two representations that are useful for what we would normally call estimation tasks. And so unsupervised learning may be the key both to the successes and the failures of human material perception and perhaps vision more broadly. So I'd like to thank you for your time and I'll stop there. So thanks very much. Questions to Roland. Maybe there's a semantic question first when you say vision as uh, inverse optics, that is the same as inverse graphics, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, a range of different terms which different people might have specific algorithmic implementations in mind. I'm talking in the broadest of terms about inverse physics, inverse graphics, inverse optics um, as a framework for thinking about vision. Excellent, Roland. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, as always. Uh, a pleasure to listen to you. Um, one of the things, when you say you should, I, I go, I mean, I, I've never bought into inverse optics, so I'm, I'm happy to let it go. However, I like cues, mm -hmm. so I'm not willing to let those go as easily. So in your kind of high dimensional feature space, is it not just another word for saying cues, there are lots and lots of cues, I mean, it's a high dimension, I mean, like instead of having five cues, we, we probably have a hundred cues. But wouldn't these features inside your network, couldn't you call them cues? Yes, I suppose you might want to, but uh, um, okay, let me take a kind of radically holistic position, which would be to say that the it's not about the dimensions of the space, it's about the embedding of the stimuli within the space. So there may even be in two different humans or two different models, two differently aligned feature spaces, um, which have the same embedding. And that for those two people or those two models, for all measurable purposes, they have the same percepts because they have the same relationships between all of the stimuli within that space. And yet, if by Q you mean a dimension within that space, the dimensions are different, so the cues are, are different. So I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not sure I am willing to go that far, um, but I think that it's at least thought provoking to consider it and, and entertain that as a, as a possibility and see how far we can get. Do we, how much do we lose in terms of being able to explain vision when we take that, um, when we take that position? It's certainly true that it, it changes the way to design new experiments. And that's, as you say, thought provoking. I mean, because that's what we are used to, right? Fiddle around with the cues. Yes. Oh, at very least, I would say that what we, so in this respect, I deeply disagree with David Ma, for example. The idea that the computational level theory should start off by a an armchair scientist um, thinking through the physics of the situation and saying, "This is the dimension. This is the cue." this is the computation that the visual system has to be performing. I think that that is erroneous. I think that um, it's much better to take a kind of gestalt psychologist approach where you start off by generating a bunch of stimuli and look at the stimuli and then start intuiting, well, what is it that I'm actually using to distinguish between these or make my judgments? Not starting with the physicist's definition of what a cue is. So I, at least in yeah. that sense of I a think cue. there we, 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 we yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I mean, the Jan Kundring, uh, you know, when he kind of had this Mars symposium said that Anyways, yeah. Please. Can I just say, when you say the unsupervised, you mean the autoencoder version just to reconstruct. And supervised is when you tell the network, say, this is Gaussian S1, this is Gaussian S2. Exactly. And so when you train it with Gaussian S1, Gaussian S2, then it does not predict the human perception as much as when you do the autoencoder. That's right. And then you just cluster. That's right. That's right. Yeah, which is which for me is not about the particular architecture or the particular algorithm. It's about using these um, two networks to instantiate two 
two views of how you can think about how we learn to see in the first place. So, you know, what one is this idea that that that, that over evolution there's been this kind of uh, some process that narrows you down or or, or or gets you to know what the what the true state of the world is in some way uh, versus a learning objective which doesn't know anything about the outside world and has to discover for itself what the ontology of the outside world is by looking for meaningful factors of variation natural degrees of variation between stimuli i think that's a much more fruitful way to to look at vision that's what or at least i think it's something we should explore more and how much uh, compression is to the auto encoder from the original image well so the the one that we um used has just 10 numbers so um the pixels were if i remember correctly 256 by 256 images uh, by three channels and the encode that we're looking at is literally just 10 numbers. It's just a vector of 10. But there's also on the top. So this bit I did not quite follow. So yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. I mean, it's, yeah, okay. So this part at the top um, is doing, is, is learning, its learning objective is the likelihood distribution of each pixel in the image, in the training set, conditioned on, all preceding pixels, uh -huh. starting in the top left-hand corner, uh -huh. right, and this num the, the num this representation here. So you can think of this as being um, so. Suppose that this weren't there, uh -huh. right? What this would be good at is learning the fine spatial structure, uh -huh. but it doesn't have any representation of what the what is common across all of the pixels in the image. Uh -huh. And so you will what you tend to end up with if you lead on this and you just train. But this um, is something that can produce sequences of pixels where in a local neighborhood, it will look like a convincing surface, but there's nothing that keeps it consistent across the whole surface. And so it's you know, making a jumbled mess. Um, and if you if you leave out this component and you just compress and then try to reconstruct using a vanilla autoencoder, you can actually get, you know, some of the way. Um, but this is very, very compressed. So you don't get very good reconstruction responses mm -hmm. and also um using a vanilla autoencoder we find that it doesn't it, it does conventional autoencoders what they don't do another a very important thing they don't have is the variational component which lets you interpolate very nicely between points within the latent space and so what that also means is that you don't get very nice such nice embeddings mm -hmm. um and so we find that with the conventional autoencoder it doesn't predict it doesn't disentangle as well, and it also doesn't predict human perception as well, either in terms of the successes or the failures. Mm -hmm. So this is why we have this variational autoencoder um, framework, which, which we found happened to work. But it's not like I think, you know, this one network architecture is something special or that matches the human brain in some meaningful way. I think when you say the current pixel conditional or uh, how, how far is conditional? Uh, Back to the first pixel. So that as many as that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, it learns very, it has the power to learn very high order statistical relationships between pixels in the image. So you can train it on much larger training sets than we used. We only had 10,000 images and they're very constrained in the sense that they're all quite similar to one another. But you can use these kinds of things also to disentangle much more complex data sets. Yeah. So why 10, not 9, not 11? Well, we did a, an analysis where we varied um, the number of dimensions here, and we found that this was an inflection point beyond which there was kind of asymptote. Um, in terms of the images that got generated by the network, they all looked equally good to humans beyond that point. Fewer than 10, and they start really falling to pieces, which is not surprising. I mean, you know, 256 by 256 pixel image, is, you know, you need a certain amount of information to capture that. Um, have you looked at what the latents, I mean, for VVs and all of that stuff, it's I think what people often look do is they look into the latent presentation, do like traverses and so on, try to figure out whether these latents on their own encode anything interesting? You, you don't. Okay. No, we did, we did that. Um, and we've got multiple instantiations with different training sets and different yeah. initial um, training situations. And um, it's always a distributed representation, okay. yeah, yeah. In, which I think doesn't really tell you very much more than that you have... Um, approximately match the size of the latent space to the dimensionality of your training yeah. set. I mean, I don't know how it's actually done here. Like in standard DIEs, you often basically have some kind of assumption that the latents are independent and then you kind of hope that they encode different. I think you need, sometimes work and sometimes you, need a, you, need, you really need an additional um, factor in your cost function if you really want to orthogonalize stuff. 
You could, there's got to be some reason for the for the given. Okay, you got you got a cube, yeah. right? You need to give it a reason why the a sphere within that cube is not sufficient um, to encode in order to force it to align its um, its the, the latent degrees of variation with the individual with individual dimensions. I think you you need some kind of sparseness criterion or some other. Yeah. Some other criterion if you really want to get them to orthogonalize yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that makes sense. So, it, I mean, like one of the, 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 the nice things that you showed is that this kind of illusion that bump height uh, has a strong influence on gloss. Have you explored, like, that you can come up, like, your model being so aligned with human perception, some sort of constrained optimization? So, what's the direction in your latent space? You have to go to maximize gloss difference while at the same time keep like the RMS difference between the images the same or like similar. Do these kind of illusion optimizations and then you you mm. find like what's the minimal change in the image into mm. least mean squared error mm. that maximizes gloss. Mm. Be a nice mm, that's cool. new it's gloss almost illusion. Quasi adversarial. Exactly. So you do yeah. this kind of gloss thing and then you it would be nice. I mean perhaps bump height is. Quite the, one of the best factors to vary. Yeah, but yeah. It'd be nice to come up who knows, with a, with a it's great idea. I haven't tried that. Gloss illusion. It, it, it's based on your model. I think that would be super nice. It, it is. It's a super great idea, and it's not that different from something I was recommending that a postdoc should do with a, a completely different supervised neural network that we've been playing with recently. Um, so um, yeah, mm -hmm. but we should try doing it with this. Actually, I thought about a similar thing earlier because I noticed when you had like the kind of the classifier score for the different uh, different um, glossinesses. I also noticed that. So I basically thought that actually looks like like bump height, and, and then like in the next slide you said, oh, but actually humans also confused it, so it makes sense. But I actually think it would be also really interesting to to test that and to see how. Yeah, yeah but whether you can really. I mean, maybe you can generate that. Um, if that doesn't work well, so I mean, that's a thing I could imagine that the model works for that. For more complicated models, you often have the problem that, like, you have nice predictions, but if you try to optimize your input, then you run into the extra adversaries, and then, like, you have things that by the model are perfectly predicted to be glossy at all, but it basically just looks exactly as the original input. Yes. Um, but what you also, of course, can do is, I mean, you have your huge data set, and you can screen that one, because then you already have images that you know they are on the manifold of natural images. Just screen for them for the images where the model predicts uh, certain properties, and that might also work for these adversaries. That's right. I mean, I think that they, that, that is uh, on a on a separate question. I think that that general approach, if you if you close the loop there, you yeah. can you can go backwards and forwards to try to match uh, model size to training set size, because I think that's one of the biggest one of the biggest problems with with large claims that are made about relationships between DNNs and um, uh, and human perception or brain activity or monkey brain activity or whatever, is that there's this huge elephant in the room, which is model size relative to training size, which has a massive impact on the nature of the representation that you end up with. And people just sort of tend to ignore that as being one of the determining factors. You know, it's like, well, this network does this. It's just not true. It's like, no, this network operating on this training set does that, right? It's a, you get very different result, results if you, if you change your training set or yeah. Your architecture size. Any more no. questions? Yeah. yeah. One more question. The auto encoder you trained uh, the model. In the end, it was uh, trained unsupervisedly. Uh, in in the end, on on pixel reconstruction, which is. It's not strictly pixel reconstruction. It's learning the likelihood distribution for each pixel. So it's learning statistics of the images rather than. Um, there's no point at which it synthesizes an image and then the cost function is evaluated on the original uh, an error between the synthesized image and the um, original image. So that's a, a normal autoencoder is trained that way, but this is not actually what that neural network was doing. But, but it's still like likelihood per pixel in RGB space. Exactly, yes. In that sense, like under Gaussian assumptions, it's exactly. minimizing gene distance. Uh, uh, Yes, yes, yes. Although I'm not sure, it's, I'm not sure actually it is a, a, a Gaussian. Yeah, I'm, I'm also not sure, but I don't think it is because it's it's a it's, it's there's a pixel CNN between between the. Yeah, I, think I don't remember. So, so I think it, it wouldn't because Gaussian would be too constrained. Yeah, but. but I, I, I'm so I'm I, I'm not. Ones are discretized and they predict uh, pixel categories or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
And, uh, sorry, but we've gone off on a yeah, tangent. Yeah. Uh, what I was hinting at that uh, it basically has to learn all details about uh, every, every pixel, yes. which is uh, probably not what the brain is doing, because in this objective, you cannot throw away information if you want to perfectly solve it. So mm. what, what do you think is the, the limitation of where, or do you have an intuition of where do we see this training scheme to deviate from humans and what mm. might be a better objective? Yes, yeah, I mean, this was really broad, stroke first way of testing yes. this this idea it would be much better to get much more um biologically plausible and and, and come up with more realistic objectives you're, you're absolutely right um i'd be a little bit hesitant to make too many predictions i think that um that there is some sense of a course to fine um element to the objectives that's training the human visual system we also know that that's true literally over time during infancy right you go from blurred versions of images to finer scale i think that that probably is also factored in to the the training objective thinking about entirely localized um quantities is never a good idea in images we, we should be thinking in 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 a in a, a wavelet space at very least um not you know nothing is done on the retina we're talking about representations that are at least a couple of layers of abstraction away from those. So I think the a learning objective that's focused on that level of representation will probably be closer to, to biological vision. Any more questions? If no, then we thank you for all that.